Thank you, Dean. Um, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, I'm truly honoured uh, this evening to be delivering the seventh Colin Crampall Memorial Lecture. Uh, I was fortunate enough to meet Colin, and he was an outstanding police leader and a remarkable and a humble man. Uh, in a distinguished career, he championed the cause of community policing. And he was also one of the pioneers in policing who saw its critical interdependency with national security. I also speak 10 years on from the inaugural lecture delivered by Peter Clark, who was then National Coordinator for National Counterterrorism Investigations in the UK. Peter, like Colin, was another believer in the importance of police having both local and global reach. Before I begin, though, I'd just like to say thank you to Policy Exchange for arranging this evening's uh, lecture, and in particular to Dean and Hannah Stewart um, for their support. So, as Dean has indicated, I speak today as I near the conclusion of my own policing career. Um, a career that began on the streets of Digbeth in Birmingham, probably not a place known to many of you, um, and leading to National Counterterrorism Policing uh, Network at Scotland Yard and my national responsibilities. Over that time, so much has happened in the world of security and terrorism. Back in the 1980s, when I joined the police service, of course, the provisional IRA posed the dominant threat in the UK. And that period saw multiple attacks generally carried out by um, well-organised active service units. But as we saw peace take hold after the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, following years of negotiations, we perhaps look forward to a time where we hope that terrorism in Britain would be a thing of the past. Then, uh, just three years later, we all stood still on 9-11 with the worst terror attack of our time. Al-Qaeda directed terrorism would then finally get through to the UK four years later on 7-7, after a number of previous plots had been prevented. Then, we subsequently saw AQ in Iraq um, transform into Daesh and we saw Islamist terrorism increasingly adopt less sophisticated methods and become less discriminate in who they target. The emergence of Daesh seems to have shadowed my own time in counter-terrorism. I, I took on the role I hold today the day before the Daesh leader al-Baghdadi declared the so-called Caliphate of the Islamic State. And of course, last year we saw tre dreadful tragedies unfold in London and in Manchester after seeing so many similar events across Europe, North America, the Middle East and Australia. So today, I wish to speak about my own reflections of these events. I'll be describing the acute threat from terrorism from both an Islamist and a right-wing ideology. I'll be setting out also what I see as the chronic threat from extremism. And I'll be explaining what I see as a whole society response that I believe is needed to address these issues. In doing so, my key premise is that the acute threat from terrorism will only be tackled when the whole of society can respond to the chronic, th to the chronic threat that we face from extremism. Islamist and right-wing extremism are reaching into our communities through sophisticated propaganda and subversive strategies creating and exploiting vulnerabilities that can ultimately lead to acts of violence and terrorism. That is why we need what I call a whole society response. From local policing to international partners, from local councils to the education system, media and social media, central and local government, civic and social agencies, the private sector, and of course, communities themselves. The days of us securocrats alone successfully addressing our national security challenges are history. In October last year, Andrew Parker, Director General of MI5, described the threat from international terrorism as follows. Today, there is more terrorist activity coming at us more quickly, and it can be harder to detect. It's multidimensional, evolving rapidly, and operating at a scale and a pace that we've not seen before. So, as we approach the first anniversary of the terror attack in Westminster, we do look back on an extraordinary and one of the most challenging of years. Tragically, we saw, uh, we saw five terror attacks, four Islamists and one extreme right wing, leaving a total of 36 people dead and hundreds more injured. But at the same time, we also saw an unprecedented number of attack plots prevented. Ten conspiracies of an Islamic nature were stopped since the Westminster attack. 
And I can also add today that over the same period, the police have been able to prevent a further four extreme right-wing plots in the UK. I think it's important we make these figures public to illustrate the significance of the growth of right-wing terrorism. For the first time, we now have a homegrown, prescribed, white supremacist, neo-Nazi terrorist group which seeks to plan attacks and build international networks. You will agree this is a matter of grave concern. In my tenure, I've seen some new and emerging characteristics of the terrorist threat. These include the shift from regionally defined organised groups to movements of amateur and professional terrorists such as Daesh, in some ways more a cult than an organisation. The breadth of attack targets has increased, now looking far beyond iconic targets. Anyone is, de anyone is deemed as legitimate, as was graphically demonstrated last year. We are also seeing simpler and more readily accessible attack methodology, not just ambitious and complex plots we saw when Peter Clark oversaw CT investigations and did the first of these speeches. Terrorists, of course, do still aspire to conduct spectacular attacks, but this lowering of the bar empower those who do not need training or sophistication. <coughs> the ease and speed in which vulnerable people can be radicalised through online propaganda and then move to attack planning has been a shocking feature of many of our cases. Examples include the youngest Briton to, be, to have been found guilty of a terrorist offence. 14 at the time, the boy from Blackburn plotted with an Australian jihadist over the internet to behead police officers at an Anzac Day parade in Australia. This apparently normal teenager from Blackburn had, had been immersed in online extremist material and groomed by adult extremists. Meanwhile, the case of Bruston Ziamani shows how quickly a person can be radicalised into carrying out an attack. Ziamani became radicalised within four months and was arrested in possession of a large knife and hammer. He had them with the intention of using them to attack a soldier. So, the volume of the threat is considerable. At this time, uh, we, we have currently over 600 investigations in, encompassing Islamist, extreme right-wing and other motivations, comprising well over 3,000 subjects of interest. In addition, we have a legacy of over 20,000 who have featured in past terrorism investigations. A deeply concerning characteristic is how both far-right and Islamist terrorism are growing, allowing each side to reaffirm their grievances and justify their actions. So, how have the often converging threats of terrorism and extremism affected our operational response? Over the past three years, compared to the three, previous three, over the past three years, arrests have doubled producing 587 charges and 478 convictions for counter-terrorism related offences. Whilst we work with partners at the same time on prevent interventions to reduce vulnerability of around 2,000 people of both Islamist and extreme right wing ideologies. In addition, since the start of the Syria conflict, around 100 children have been safeguarded through family court procedures and to contend with the ever-increasing global nature of terrorism in the UK, CT policing now operates in over 90 countries. So, with this increased demand, we now have to stretch to cover far more volume in an environment where plots develop far more rapidly and conspirators can work in secrecy online. Our strength comes from a constant hunger to improve and to learn lessons. For example, following last year's events, as has been widely reported, ourselves and MI5 immediately commissioned an operational improvement review, which, under the independent scrutiny of David Anderson, proposed three step changes. The first responds to the growing extreme right-wing terror threat through bringing the skills and techniques of MI5 to this fight alongside the police. The second step change aims to improve capability, especially in data analytics, to spot behavioural escalation particularly within that very large cohort of former subjects of interest. The third step change 
proposes going beyond the existing national security community, uh, national security community relationships to enable the widest range of local partners to play their part in managing the risk posed by former, su former subjects of interest reactivating their extremist activities. A key, underpin a key underpinning principle to these step changes is to better connect our pursue and prevent activities to better manage, the, manage those who are hovering between radicalised and mobilised. Nevertheless, there are many reasons we should be optimistic in our nation's ability to confront the acute threat from terrorism. First, we do benefit from a mature national security infrastructure. Cancer terrorism policing, MI5 and others have built a highly capable and effective partnership allowing us to jointly confront a range of threats, Islamist, Irish Republican and extreme right wing, for example. Second, political support and our legal tools. We have been fortunate to have had successive governments from different political sides investing in counter-terrorism capabilities and also providing continually and continually refining sound legal framework that enables us to do our job. Third, we have a low availability of illegal firearms. The relative difficulty in procuring such weapons in Great Britain is an advantage that we must sustain. We are not complacent and we continue to work tire tirelessly on this with, amongst others, the National Crime Agency and Border Force to make it as difficult as possible for terrorists to access weaponry. Fourth, we're an island nation with strong borders and this provides an obvious advantage when it comes to the movement of terrorists and material in and out of the country. However, it doesn't, of course, remove the requirement for strong partnerships with our international counterparts, both in Europe and beyond. Last but not least is the age-old British model of community, community policing and the trust and legitimacy that it secures. The founder of British policing, Sir Robert Peel, said in 1829, the police are the public and the public are the police. And that principle is as true today as it was nearly 200 years ago. We invest heavily in community engagement, which is why public confidence remains high. So, I've started by briefly setting out the acute threat from terrorism, its characteristics and how they translate operationally, and the advantages I suggest are offered by our policing model. But British policing has always valued prevention above all else. Indeed, Peel's first principle was the basic mission for policing is to prevent crime and disorder. That implies working with others on causes, and so I now wish to, I now wish to turn to the chronic threat from extremism and how it creates a fertile environment that allows the acute threat of terrorism to exist and to thrive. I see extremists from Islamist and far-right persuasions both executing a common strategy. Empirically, as a practitioner, I see four components. First, extremists reach into communities through sophisticated propaganda. Second, extremists create intolerance and isolation by exploiting grievances. Third, extremists reinforce this sense of isolation by generating distrust of state institutions. And fourth, extremists then offer warped parallel alternatives that undermine our values of tolerance and diversity. These together help create the isolated, fearful setting that terrorists can step into, whether that's in person or online, to inspire often vulnerable people to carry out attacks. As someone who has overseen hundreds of counter-terrorism investigations, I've repeatedly seen how terrorism creates or exploits such vulnerabilities. So, for example, the Finsbury Park attacker, Darren Osborne, had grown to hate Muslims largely due to his consumption of large amounts of online far-right material. That, in that included, as evidenced in court, statements from the former EDL leader, Tommy Robinson, from others from Britain First and others. Osborne had a dysfunctional background and a history of drug and alcohol abuse and violence, and there can be little doubt that the extremist rhetoric that he consumed fed into his vulnerabilities and turned it into violence. 
The murder of Lee Rigby was another example where extremism leads to terrorism. The attackers had been long-term extremists, mainly involved in activism, but over time they were further radicalised, ultimately turning their fanaticism into murder. One of the main groups who inspired them was the pernicious organisation al Majaroom, also known as ALM. Led by Anjam Chowdhury, their primary role was to justify and defend Islamist terrorism. The group had links to, terrorist, to the terrorists who attacked London on 7-7, as well as numerous other attacks and plots in the UK and overseas. The individuals had a long history of vile but lawful behaviour. However, after ALM leadership pledged allegiance to, IS, to ISIL in 2014, dismantling this dangerous group became one of our top priorities and we were able to get Chowdhury and many of the members charged and subsequently convicted. While Chowdhury became the de facto spokesman for Islamism in the UK, mouthpieces from the, front, far, mouthpieces from the far right wing, such as Tommy Robinson, also attracted attention and notoriety. Robinson became a regular feature in our media, giving him the platform to attack the whole religion of Islam by conflating acts of terrorism with the faith often citing spurious claims, inevitably stirring up tensions. Such figures, I would suggest, represent no more than the extreme margins of the communities that they claim to speak for, and yet they have been given prominence and a platform to espouse their dangerous misinformation and propaganda. <clears throat> Today we continue to see and hear so-called representative bodies speak out in, a, in such a way to create and exploit grievances and isolation by being equivocal in condemning acts of terrorism, by undermining efforts to safeguard the young and vulnerable from radicalisation, and by spreading misinformation about national security and about foreign policy. <coughs> For example, even though a third of all referrals under the Channel programme relate to right-wing right extremism, members of the organisation CAGE characterise PREVENT as an attack on Islam. Their representatives have also sought to whip up ridiculous claims that all Muslims are terror sus suspects in the eyes of the authorities. And they famously described Jihadi John suspect as a, quote, beautiful young man. Meanwhile, leaders of MEND have claimed the UK is approaching the conditions preceded by the preceding the Holocaust, Holocaust, seeking to undermine uh, the state's considerable efforts to tackle all hate crime and clearly making an absurd comparison with what was indeed state-sponsored genocide. One of men's former leading figures lost a libel case labelling, has, labelling him as, quotes, a hardline Islamistic, Islamic extremist in the context of comments he had made supporting the killing of British soldiers in Iraq. Meanwhile, Britain First uses deliberately provocative actions such as mosque incursions and Christian patrols in areas with high Muslim population, confronting imams and making inflammatory claims against them Soaking, seeking to stoke up community tensions. Far-right far right groups have also used cases of child sexual exploitation by largely Asian groups as a catalyst to try and spread discord and hatred against Muslim communities. Jada France and deputy leader of the far-right group Britain First went as far as to say that, quote, the world is at war with Islam. I plan to, st I plan to stand with you to fight the bloody lot of them. And aiming to undermine authority, she declared that her organisation is, quote, a declaration against our own corrupt establishment. Each side feeds into the other's extremist rhetoric, with the common goal of increasing tensions and divisions in communities. At the same time as these highly public examples of extremism, we've seen more insidious strategies being adopted, such as extremists infiltrating schools, so it's extremists infiltrating schools, public institutions and places of worship to radicalise children and young people. These highly worrying cases come just three years after the so-called Trojan, Trojan horse affair, the organised attempt to enforce an Islamist ethos in schools in Birmingham came to light. Peter Clarke found clear evidence that there had been a coordinated, deliberate and sustained action Carried, by, carried out by people in positions of influence in schools and governing bodies who espoused, endorsed or failed to challenge extremist views. Sadly, these were not isolated events. Ofsted inspectors remain concerned about the vulnerabilities 
in our education system. Recently, Ofsted's Amanda Spielman said, in, said that in the worst cases, the subversive activities indoctrinate impressionable minds with extremist ideology. We're also seeing the alarming occurrence of known extremists removing their children from school altogether and teaching them at home. One London study found that nearly half had done so. An equally disturbing phenomenon has been the introduction of whites-only food banks that we have found being set up in a small number of city centre locations across the country and either pop up or involve members um, going out to find rough sleepers who are again vulnerable. We've also seen leafleting, leafleting campaigns promoting whites-only messages, um, targeting ca university campuses and, or, and, uh, in order to attract and to prey on the more vulnerable and the more easily influenced. So, ironically, whilst Islamist and right -wing, extreme right-wing ideologies may appear to be at opposing ends of the argument, it is evident to me that they both have a great deal in common. And I think it's important to expose some of what we see as extremists systematically and determinedly trying to undermine a peaceful, tolerant and democratic society. I am reassured, though, that we have many advantages in addressing these challenges. I see many impressive leaders stepping forward to confront these issues, including uh, William Shawcross and Amanda Spielman for their work in highlighting and tackling extremism in our charity and academic sectors. Louise Casey for her report into opportunity and integration and Sarah Khan for our outstanding efforts in this critical policy area, um, starting with a charity and no doubt um, and her work to come as the new Counter Extremism Commissioner. But our biggest advantage lies in the resilience and tolerance of communities that was so visible last year after last year's attacks, where we saw faith leaders and communities come together and drown out the extremists who seek to exploit such tragedies. So, So, having set out the acute and chronic threats posed by extremism and terrorism from both Islamist and extreme right-wing ideologies, I will now talk about why these distinct yet connected challenges, in my view, require a whole society response. First, I should be clear about the role of the police and our limitations. We do proudly engage in crime, prevent crime prevention, but would never want to become the main lever to tackle complex social and political issues. My thrust is rather to propose that we can collectively do more to make it harder for the extremists' strategy to endure. As extremists target vulnerable or isolated individuals and communities to create fear and hatred, it is critical that we collectively do everything possible to undermine their efforts so that we can dramatically reduce the recruiting ground that they provide for terrorists. Remember, the majority of people we arrest in counter-terrorism and policing are British. This means every part of society, not the, just those charged with national security responsibilities, coming together to confront the twin challenges of terrorism and extremism. I do not pretend these issues are easy, or that I have the expertise across all these sectors, but I do talk as a senior police officer with a practical insight into the challenges and I want to provoke a debate about how we can best collectively overcome them. <clears throat> First, as I have already said, it is vital that we, the police and MI5, squeeze every drop of learning from our reviews of last year's cases. However, as I've said, it is vital that the police and intelligence services do not overreach into areas and problems where we have no legitimacy or, right, or right, rightful place to be. This would go against the principles of a free society. Conversely, it must be recognised that with such freedoms come no absolute assurance that no further tax will ever occur. As David Anderson QC rightly said in his report into the London and Manchester terror attacks when reflecting on our operational improvements, quotes, they will not remove the risk of a terrorist attack. To do, that, to do so would be manifestly impossible in a free society. So, moving on to other sectors. Second, the private sector has an enormous role to play in a number of ways. They've made considerable progress in three decades in their commitment to design out crime. We now need the same vigour used against terrorism and extremism. For example, there's much to do beyond current good practice examples, 
such as the partnering on terrorist preventing terrorist financing, um, the work developing protective security measures, and their work on staff um, awareness training. Uh, we also think much more can be done collaboratively in the space of data, insider threat, and, in, and, in, and industry vigilance. Third, for areas of social policy, integration, and education. As, as I say, I'm not an expert in these fields, but I've seen enough to know that much more needs to be done to address some of the evidence vulnerabilities in schooling. Furthermore, um, Dame Louise Casey in her report into Opportunity and Integration evidenced particular challenges um, for both poor white working class children and also in isolated communities of Pakistani and Bangladeshi heritage. Her recommendations for strengthening approaches to resilience and integration and addressing economic seclusion make a lot of sense to me. Fourth, the family courts and social services are now routinely wrestling with child protection and safeguarding issues arising out of terrorism and extremism. However, we still see cases where parents convicted of terrorist-related offences, including radicalisers, retain care of their own children. I wonder if we need more parity between protecting children from paedophiles and terrorist parents. <coughs> Fifth, mainstream and social media. It's difficult to measure the impact caused by the likes, likes of Chowdhury and Robinson, but there can be little doubt they have been afforded disproportionate attention by the media, providing a platform to espouse their dangerous views. I'm grateful the media is challenging itself on this subject and was pleased to be invited to last year's Society of Editors annual conference to take part in a debate that they entitled, Are We Doing the Terrorist Job for Them? As well as traditional media, questioning themselves about affording extremists a platform, we need to ask much more of social media and communication service providers to address the vulnerabilities and ungoverned space online. It cannot be right that a person can be radicalised online by viewing illegal content, where he can talk with extremists using encrypted communications, where he can research potential targets online without leaving a trace, where he can purchase bomb-making materials from online retailers and where he can download instructions on how to assemble and detonate his device. Sixth, communities. Over the years, we have seen how the contribution from the public has helped save lives. From the worker who reported the suspicious storing of fertiliser that helped stop a major attack, to the community member more recently who alerted the police about the changing behaviour of a 19-year-old would-be terrorist. The participation of the public is a very powerful tool. And as a country, we should be proud of an approach that puts protecting vulnerable people at the heart of it. And in my view, it has helped prevent numerous attacks. So as you've seen, I don't pretend to know all the means of the whole society approach, but I do have a clear understanding in my mind as to what I see as the end. I've spoken much about isolation and vulnerability. I've described how extremists create and exploit these conditions and how terrorists then turn them into violence. Surely the best end is to transform that vulnerability into resilience and that isolation into integration. This will give us the best response to the twin threat from extremism and terrorism. And I think it's for the aforementioned sectors and others to get mobilized, get more confident and uh, develop the means that are necessary. So in conclusion, Today I have set out the acute threat from both Islamist and right-wing terrorism. I have described its new and emerging characteristics and the operational challenges that it presents. I have also spoken about the chronic threat from extremism and all its guises, which in my view are an equally critical national challenge. And I have illustrated the connections between extremism and terrorism how the one provides the recruiting ground for the other, and how vulnerability converts into violence. Some of these issues are contentious, and before I conclude, I want to be clear that I'm not saying that extremism and terrorism are simply two ends of a conveyor belt. I'm not suggesting that we need laws or powers that criminalise extremist views, and I'm not blaming whole communities. I simply condemn the awful behaviour of a few who claim to represent them. My assertions, though, are based on the evidence of nearly four years leading the UK's counter-terrorism policing effort. And it's at this point I would like to take the opportunity to express my pride and my admiration 
uh, for my policing and security service colleagues for their extraordinary efforts over the past four years in confronting the threat. And in particular in 2017, we asked so much of, of them and we saw them respond in the best possible way. Now we need a whole society response that has the buy-in of all to come on board and be part of our collective efforts to protect the public and our national security. Countries around the world are experiencing similar challenges from this twin threat from Islamist and right-wing extremist and terrorism. But I know of no other country better able to confront this threat than the UK. And I do know that Colin would have shared this optimism. Thank you very much.